Welcome back to the Historian's Craft, guys. So let's jump right into this video. On August 23rd, 1939, the Third Reich and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, otherwise known as Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, conclude a non-aggression pact, the result of which basically gives the Germans a free hand in Europe, where the Soviets would not intervene, at least theoretically speaking. For the Germans, this deal made sense. The German economy at this point in 1939 was not ready for a war of the magnitude that they wanted to launch, um, and the Western Front needed to be secured before any action could be taken against the Soviet Union. But then we have to deal with the other side of the equation. Why would the Soviet Union have agreed to such a pact? Well, there are many reasons to have done so, but Stuart Goldman argues in his book, Norman Hahn, 1939, The Red Army's Victory That Shaped World War II, um, that it was the result of a border conflict well removed from Europe in Mongolia and the Japanese colony of Manchukuo. So, as I'm sure many of you know by this point, um, once everything going on in the world is over and done with, my plan is to pursue graduate school where I want to focus on um, the Japanese colonial empire, Nazi Germany, and the relationship between those two states, specifically where the Holocaust is concerned. Um, so for me, anything that deals with Imperial Japan or the Japanese colonial empire is like required reading, <laughs> including this book. So, Norman Han, this area in Mongolia, otherwise known as uh, Kalkin Gol, which is how the Soviets know it. This is one of those areas where the rivers are constantly moving where they constantly shift and in the shifting they constantly rework the landscape um, so the definition of borders is really difficult to pin down and because of that the soviets the mongolians the japanese and the manchurians they have different ideas about well where the border really ends so between the 11th of may and the 16th of september so around the time that non-aggression pact between germany and the soviet union is signed um, Japanese, Soviet, and Mongolian army units clashed near the village of Norman Han, hence the name of the battle, the Battle of Norman Han, again, otherwise known as the Battle uh, of Kalkin Gol. In the aftermath of this, um, you know, what is basically like an undeclared border conflict, um, it results in military reforms both in Japan and in the Soviet Union, but Goldman's argument, which he began as a doctoral dissertation back in the 70s, um, and finally worked into a book, this book, is that the fighting, what it does is terrifies the Red Army enough and the Soviet leadership enough to the point that they potentially feared a Japanese invasion, um, and with good reason. It showed that the Soviet army wasn't necessarily, in 1939, all it was cracked up to be. And the result is that due to this distraction, which lasts for months, because the Soviets were preoccupied with this, they signed that non-aggression pact with Germany as a way to secure their own western border, so they can focus on the east. So the main strength of this book, and this is where Goldman really shows his strength as a scholar because he knows Japanese and Russian, two very difficult languages, um, he draws heavily on a mix of Japanese and Soviet sources, I mean, to the extent that this stuff is even available, um, but it focuses heavily on the rivalries and the problems, specifically within the Imperial Japanese Army. That's what it does well. The problem is that after it deals with those topics, after it deals with, you know, the tactics and the rivalries in the Japanese Army, and a little bit with the Soviet Army, it starts to run into some problems. So the book's not perfect, um, but if you were interested in World War II or the Japanese colonial empire or the history of the Soviet Union, you know, you need to pick this up. That being said, we need to talk about what this book does not so well. So, you know, as you can tell from me holding it, it's not that big. It's only 185 pages, not including the bibliography and the endnotes. Um, so there's only so much that Goldman could really cram into this. And an overly detailed examination of Soviet and Japanese foreign policy. I mean, that's not really his aim. He fully admits the book's limitations, and he admits on relying on key established works on Soviet and Japanese diplomacy, um, as reference to gain a better picture of the events. Really, this is a monograph on a very specific event. Now, because I just mentioned that he relies on other texts, other books, um, for a broad outline of Soviet and Japanese foreign policy, if you're interested in that, what you need to read, especially for the Soviet stuff, is, um, the big guy. 
So that big guy is Adam Ulam's expansion and coexistence Soviet foreign policy, 1917 to 1973. It's this guy right here. This is like the key work. Um, it's maybe not the earliest, but it's definitely one of the most foundational texts on Soviet foreign policy. So that being said, you know, he broadly follows Ulam's outline of Soviet foreign policy. So that's a slight problem. Uh, with this book is that he's relying heavily on a separate work, but there are some other minor issues with this book as well. Not every single Japanese leader wants an alliance with Nazi Germany, um, and I'll talk about why that was in a separate video. So when Goldman talks about Tokyo speaking with a single voice or about the Japanese wanting or not wanting the alliance, it's hard to paint that with a broad brush. He also does not elaborate um, why, for example, the Kwantung Army, that is the Japanese army in uh, Manchukuo, has relatively poor intelligence on Soviet movements in the border regions. But at the same time, you know, he doesn't explain why the Soviets have poor intelligence on the Japanese movements. Maybe there's not actually an answer to those questions, but if that is the case, um, he doesn't specify that this was a strictly Kwantung army issue. Instead, he just paints the Imperial Japanese army as a whole of having that problem. And, you know, like I said, the Soviet side has similar issues, but in the end, I do think his reinterpretation of Soviet foreign policy and the long-term impacts of this battle does hold water. My problem is that the long-term effects of that battle, um, though not entirely covered, like I said, this book's only 185 pages, so they're just kind of hinted at, but that being said, this book is crucial um, in the historiography of this topic because it serves as a jumping-off point to explore those further issues. So hopefully in the future we'll see Goldman specifically, but also other scholars as well, you know, do more work on the subject. So that's it for now, guys. Like I said, if you were interested in any way in Imperial Japan, in the Soviet Union, or in World War II, you have to pick this up at some point. So with that being said, I'm going to end the video here. Hope you all enjoyed. Take care, and I will see you all next time.